welcome to Get Organized Challenge number two. And I just want to say, I am so excited about this group of participants. There were so many progress posts and so many big benefits boards and there was stuff every, some really detailed, creative, major work, big benefits board and then some really just basic, I got it in a list, I got it done big benefits boards and that is amazing that so many of you got that done so congratulations and thanks for all your hard work this week and it's gonna pay off for you I promise so welcome to number two be a paper sorting powerhouse and um, here's how the GOC works if you're new I'm gonna talk you're gonna listen there's a little text box if you have a question you're gonna type the word question in all caps and that's Karen like a red flag to Karen so if she knows that you have a question she'll do her best to answer it there are some people with us who've taken the challenge before. They may pipe in and answer as well. Um, progress posts need to be posted by, well, by noon on Tuesdays. And then Karen puts all your progress posts. I'm sorry, you don't even know what that is if you're new. If you're new, uh, you're going to get an assignment. And then you're going to post a progress note. And there's two winners chosen from all the progress posts. And they each get a gift certificate to our website. So make sure you post your progress. Um, oh, if you haven't downloaded your workbook, please do that as well because there are live links in the workbook to all the things that I talk about during the class. So if I'm referring to a video or a printable or something like that, it's all linked in the workbook. You can download the workbook right from the Get Organized Challenge page on our website. All right, there is a little bit of a delay as well, so it could be just a few seconds all the way up to about a minute. So if we get to the end and you're asking a question and nobody's answering, it's probably because we're already gone at this end of the world. So please visit our Facebook uh, group and ask the question, or you can email us directly, customer service at totally-tiffany.com. All right, let's get started. Let's get started with this week's winners. Woo! First winner, got to put my glasses on. Congratulations, Michelle Sterling. She says, I'm so excited. This is my third time taking the challenge. I made good progress last year when I was laid off. Then hooray, I found a wonderful job. Hooray, congratulations on your job, Michelle. And sadly, my efforts for organization were hit and miss. Then in December, I had to shove everything away uh, so my in-laws could stay in the guest room. And now I'm ready to get organized. So Michelle is on a roll. She's got a little bit longer post than that. Um, you can read it on the update that comes out at the end of the class. And then our second winner, Denise Denny Shearer, a progress report, big benefits board, check, themes and sentiments list, check, all supplies gathered, check, purge box ready, check, taking it to a local daycare, check, evaluated space, hubby moved some things around, organized only, ready to go, took some before picks, hooray, we love to see those, and got the buy-in from my bestie who's going to encourage me. So. Boy, I just can't tell you how impressed I was this week with seeing all the work that got done. I mean, just a really, really productive group. I'm wondering if it might be because we started later in January. I'll have to keep that in mind for next year. Usually we start like the first week of January and um, you guys probably need a couple more weeks to put your tree away and get all that stuff handled maybe. So next year maybe we'll start late as well. All right. Our goals for this uh, session are, at the end of this session, you should have a solid understanding of how to organize your paper stash, both the mental process of organization and the physical process of organizing your stuff. You should have a good idea of what to do with kits and stacks and kind of the weird things that come along in paper organizing, scraps. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the importance of an organized only space. We talked, touched on that a little bit uh, last week but we're gonna talk about it more right now. What is an organized only space? It is an empty space that you're gonna create before you start putting things away. And the only things that go in that space are things that you've already organized, right? So it doesn't have to be a huge space. It can be a, a shelf that's cleared off. It could be a couple of Ikea cubes that are empty. It just needs to be a space that you feel good about, that's clean and ready to receive your organized only supplies. And then as you organize more stuff, pull more, st pull more stuff off the other side of the shelf, pour, pull more stuff out of the other cubes, that's gonna create a new and empty organized only space for you as you work through your supplies. So keep that in mind. It's really, really important 
that as you're, once you've sorted something, that you put it back somewhere where it looks good. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be an amazing room like we all see those amazing craft rooms on the internet. It doesn't have to look like that. It just has to be a clean, neat space that you can actually put things into and see them and remind yourself regularly about how good that looks and what your, uh, how effective and efficient your space is gonna be. So, organized only space is key. All right, let's talk about the mental process of sorting your paper. There are only three sections that we're gonna use out of the four section system when we talk about paper organizing, right? Themes and sentiments, calendar year, and the rainbow. Alphabets and numbers doesn't really apply when we talk about um, sorting paper because there's not a lot of paper that's alphabets and numbers, right? It's usually a sticker or stickers or you know, chipboard or something like that. It's not really paper. If you do have paper that has alphabets and numbers on it, it probably belongs in your school section or back to school September section, however you categorize that. So themes and count themes and sentiments in the calendar year, those are all pretty easy, right? We get it. Beach, baby, birthday, winter, spring, summer, fall, Valentine's Day, Halloween, Christmas, that's easy. The thing that we get challenged with is the rainbow, right? Because there are so many variables in the rainbow. So the big challenge we come up with is what do we do with um, scraps? What do we do with uh, print and pattern papers? And what do we do with papers that have mixed colors in them, right? This is where people get kind of stuck. So the general rule of thumb is go with the color that why you bought that paper or um, can you close the door? Why you bought the paper or um, what color jumps out at you most, right? Um, so if you bought it because it was red, if you love the red dots, whatever it is, then it's gonna go in red, whatever color speaks to you. So when we talk about organizing, you're gonna go light to dark and then um, prints and patterns are gonna be in the back, right? So I pulled out my red section, or section of red section, I guess, um, out of my thing. So you could kind of take a look at what I'm talking about. So in the very front, I've got my little tab that says red. And then the first thing I've got is my um, re big red scraps, right? So we're gonna talk about scraps and, and how to choose them and which ones to keep. But I've got big red scraps. And then after my solid reds, then I get into prints and patterns. So the first thing I've got here is some glitter, woo! But then you can see I just used one of our little shut your flap tabs. And this is all distressed paper that in my mind is gonna go in the red category. That if I was looking for something red and distressed, this is where it belongs. Now, some papers are double-sided. I think I see one coming up here, yes, okay. So this paper has stripes on the other side. And I hate to break the news to you folks, but you just have to choose. Where do you want it? So this used to be in part of a group called, I don't, I can't read it, I don't my glasses on. But when I finished using that um, collection of paper, this is all that was left. And I just thought, you know what, I like the red, not a big fan of the other side. You might feel differently. You might be like, oh, I love those stripes. That's going to go in green. But for me, I like the red and it's distressed. And so into red distressed it went. And then behind distressed, then I'm going to go to patterns. So I'm starting out with dots here and then flat florals, right? And then I've got more dots and then I'm into plaids, right? So this is another good example. This is cute red and white checked paper, but the back side is like the ugliest barbecue paper ever, right? I know I'm never gonna use that. There's a good chance that red and white check is gonna get used for me. So, and there's some plaid and then some stars. So it doesn't really matter how you do it. If you noticed, mine are sort of in alphabetical order, right? I've got um, dots and then plaid and then stars. Um, if I had stripes, they would be in there at, right behind the stars. So consistency is key, but don't get overwhelmed and don't make it really difficult, right? You might just say, I'm just gonna put all my patterns together or all my distressed in patterns together. I don't care, just group together by color. That's fine too. One of the things about organizing your paper, and I'm gonna strongly recommend that you go vertical with your paper organization, right? The beautiful thing about that is that you, when your paper is vertical, you can literally thumb through, flip through your paper, 
and get an idea of everything that's in there, right? So it's easy to see what all your choices are. It's quick and easy. I know some of you might still have those. Um, it isn't very often that I tell you you need, you need to replace what you've got. But if you're using flat paper racks, let me tell you why I'm not a fan of the flat paper rack. The flat paper rack was designed for use in a store. And in a store, everything in that tray of paper is exactly the same. So the racks are staggered. You can only see the top sheet in each piece, in each rack. And that was okay because that tool was designed to hold 25 or 50 sheets of exactly the same paper. So you only needed to see the top. But as crafters, we don't have, well, some of us have 25 sheets of the same paper. We probably shouldn't, but we might. Um, but you have a, a huge variety. And so if your paper's in those racks, even if you have it, let's say you have rainbow, red, light to dark, right? You have to take, and you want light, you have light on the top and dark's on the bottom, and you need dark, you have to take the whole thing out, right? You're banging up the edges in the corners. The complete thing is exposed to light. So if you have a problem with light, that could be another issue. Um, and then you have to get to the paper that you want on the bottom, and then you have to put that whole thing back. So it's time consuming and it's cumbersome. And what happens when things are time consuming and cumbersome is that it's difficult to take things out and it's difficult to put things away so you don't do it. So you might think, Oh, I'd love to do a little bit of scrapbooking, but I don't have that much time and hauling out all the paper. That's going to be a pain. Um, and then you might take some paper out and not use it. And then you'd be like, oh, I don't really want to put that away. That's going to be a pain. I'll just leave it right here. I'll get to it later. And eventually you have this big pile of stuff on your desk, right? So one of the things you're going to hear me say over and over as we go through the challenge is the e if it's easy, you'll do it. And it's, if it's difficult, you won't. So when you go vertical with your paper, it becomes really easy to pull out that dark red paper and when you're done using it, slide it back in, right? Super simple. It's really easy also when you're vertical, if you buy new paper, to put it in the right place right away. You don't have to dig to the bottom of a stack or split a stack, take half the stack out, put the new paper in, put the rest of the stack back. You can just go right to that section, whether it's a rainbow or a theme, go to your tab and insert the paper. So. Vertical paper storage it usually protects your paper a little bit more, edges and corners. It's easier to protect it from light if that's an issue for you, easier to take it out, and easier to put it away. So there we go. There's my two cents on that. All right. So next up, what are the exceptions? Well, I kind of already mentioned an exception here, um, and that is you always want to keep things together you use together, right? So I had that piece of paper that was left from, I can't, I think it was called Roadshow or something, where there was only one piece of paper left and it was a travel collection. Well, the paper itself isn't, wasn't specific to travel, right? It was red on one side and striped on the other side. I didn't have anything left in the collection that went with it that was travel related. So at the point that I used up the majority of the collection, I took the paper and just put it into my red section, right? So you want to keep things together you're going to use together. So keep those collections together. But at the point that they're no longer a collection, it's just a few stray pieces, then move them to whatever area you're most likely to use them in. All right. Oh, the other exception. If you buy something specifically for a project, if you bought pink floral paper because it matches all the pink ballet embellishments that you're going to use to do your daughter's ballet pages, then you definitely don't want to use up that paper before you do the ballet pages, which you might do if you put it in pink. You definitely want to remember that you did buy it when you're doing the ballet pages, right? So you're going to put it in the ballet section. As Soon as you're done with the ballet pages, then you can take that pink floral paper and put it into pink where you will use it um, maybe on something else once you're done with ballet. So the, the main point of uh, the whole sorting and organizing needs to come back to keep things together, you use together. And that's a question that you're going to ask yourself, not only about paper, but about other things as we go through the challenge. <sighs> this is where you have to take a deep breath. <sighs> and accept the fact that you're probably going to put some paper in the wrong place. But I have a question for you. I wish I could see a show of hands, right? Uh, I, I want to see a show of hands by this. Uh, type a capital X in the comment box if, if, the, if your answer is yes to this question. If you got to craft 
a little bit every day for the rest of your life, would you ever run out of paper, right? So there's probably very few X's popping up right now because most of us, if there's one thing we have plenty of, it's paper. Excuse me. So I want you to think about this. Why do we have so much paper? 90% of what we're doing over the next now seven weeks is the mental process of it, right? I have heard so many things about why people use their paper or not use their paper, I guess. And I want you to keep that in mind. I want you to keep it at the front of your brain. When you buy paper and then you pull it out to look at it for the Valentine card you're making your husband, and you go, oh, I'd love to use this, but gosh, it's just really too pretty for a card. Or it's really too nice for this page, right? I talked about this last week. If you were on board last week, what's going to happen three, four, five years from now when you pull that paper out, you're going to go, oh, that was, that's hideous. Why did I think that was so pretty when I bought it, right? Because scrapbooking, card making, crafting, mixed media art, all those things, those are all fashion forward hobbies, right? Even sewing, in, when you talk about the uh, paper companies that are doing sewing fabrics, right? You're seeing the same colors and the same styles and as styles change in paper crafting and sewing, the colors, uh, textures, all those things change as well. So something you bought today, you're probably not gonna think is attractive five years from now. The other thing is, if you craft with the things that you're buying today, uh, not only are you using, which is good, you're using, that's good, uh, you are um, current, your pages and your projects are current with the styles, fashions, and colors of today, right? So last year it was chevrons. They were everywhere. They were on curtains and throw pillows. They were in skirts and blouses. They were in hair clips. They were in scrapbooking. They were in card making, right? Everywhere. Have you seen a chevron this year? Probably not. But if you used your chevrons while you were crafting last year, crafting or making those cards or doing those scrapbook pages, your pages are so hip for that time frame. Okay, so use your stuff, ladies. Use your stuff and gentlemen if you're out there. Nothing bad is going to happen if you file something in the wrong place. So don't worry about it. You might be flipping through your red section and all of a sudden a piece of paper like, oh, that's really purple. I wonder why that's in there. You can pull it out and move it to the purple. It's so simple, but I guarantee you when you have enough paper that when you sit down to pull paper, you are going to find exactly what you need. You're going to find the perfect paper every single time. All right. So what do you do with kits and stacks? So if you are somebody who gets kits in the mail, um, which is really fun, um, but then what do you do with them? How do you organize them? We want to keep things together that we use together. So if you're getting your pizza box in the mail, like this, right, with all your goodies in it, I don't want you to take it all apart and store it around. What I want you to do, generally when you're gonna get something like this, it's gonna have that flyer on the inside that's like this month's kit is beaches and barbecue, and it's gonna have pictures of everything that's in it, maybe a little checklist of what's there. So you can either take that checklist, that piece of paper, out of the box, Give the box a number, right? So just what, like start with one. I always start with 100. I don't know, but that's how I do it. Um, okay, summer fun. That's what we'll call it. Not beaches and barbecues. Summer fun, right? So you're going to write 101 on the box, summer fun, and then you're going to take that flyer and you're going to put it in your summer section with a note on it that says 101. And then as you're flipping through summer, you're gonna be like, oh, I have that kit for summer fun. It's number 101. You can go right to your shelf and pull off the box that you need right away, right? So what I want you to do, and this is the first time you're gonna hear about it, but it's not the last time, is I want you to think about how you can create a representation of something within your organization system that will drive you back to another thing that doesn't fit in that organization system or shouldn't be in this case in the organization system. So this is the first like linking thing that we're gonna do. Take things that are already organized and already in a box and link them back to where you're actually gonna see them, right? One of the keys we talked about earlier, that visibility. If you can see your stuff, you're gonna use your stuff. So you wanna make it as visual as possible and then you wanna make it as easy as possible to go and get that thing that's not in your four section system. Okay, what about stacks? So the first question, right? This whole thing is all like a little bit like therapy, right? 
um, as we go through the challenge here. Um, the first question you need to ask yourself about stacks is why do you buy them? What's your motivation for buying stacks? Sue's laughing. Um, <laughs> um, why do you buy stacks, right? Um, and do you use them if you buy them? I have a girlfriend who will buy a stack and do an entire album with all the paper in that stack, right? Generally, they're, it's just a color stack, she's, and she's really good about just working through, this is the paper I'm using for this album, and it's a done deal, right? Most of us don't have that discipline, and nor do we want to, right? We like the joy of picking individual things and buying individual things. Okay, so with stacks, you probably are buying a stack one of two reasons then. The first reason is, as Sue mentioned, it's on sale. The second reason is, the most common reason for it is that you have your 40 off coupon for Michaels or Joann's or Hobby Lobby and the thing that you went in there to buy is already on sale and stacks are $20 so you're going to save $8 so then you're going to buy one for 12 bucks and that's a good deal and you got to use that 40 off coupon on something right? I know you ladies. Um, here's what I want you to do. Stop it. I want you to stop doing that. Um, you're not alone. I, I've done it myself. I'm guilty of buying the you know, $12 stack with my 40 off coupon. But what happens with stacks is a lot of times you end up with paper in there that you will never use. Case in point, this stack, not just like a 48 sheet stack, 180 sheets. How can you pass that up, right, for $12 with a coupon? And they're all holidays and seasons. And if you flip through it, you will see that most of them are really ugly. Okay? <laughs> so I got sucked in by this, like, ooh, 180 pieces of paper. It's holiday stuff. I'll use it. But you know that that's not how your holiday pages and cards go, right? You decide on the theme or the style or the look, and then you're going to pick that paper to go with it. So I wrote on the back when I bought this, 121 2013 I paid $20 for it. I've used exactly three sheets of paper out of it. So that makes the average cost of a piece of paper about $6.33. Is that right? Maybe, no, $6.75. Anyway, too much for ugly paper, okay? So keep it in mind. What I want you to do going forward is keep your wits about you when you're shopping and think through that whole process of why am I buying it? What am I going to do with it? Where am I going to put it when I get home? How am I going to use it? I'm going to talk about this again in embellishments, but just to give you a sneak peek. So what happens in your brain is going to manifest itself in your craft room. So if you can start organizing things in your brain before you get them home, it's going to be so much easier to organize your stuff when you actually get it home. Okay, there's my lecture. All right, so you already have the stacks. That's what you're thinking. You're sitting there going, Thanks for the lecture, but I already have them. What do I do with them? You're just going to incorporate them right into your four section system as close as you possibly can. So um, when we talk about going vertical, you want to go vertical with your stacks as well, right? So some of you have your stacks stacked up like this at home, and that's not going to work. You're not going to dig to the bottom of that stack to find something. So what I want you to do is take a sticky note, or this is one of our little shut your flap tabs. Right? So it's like a plastic sticky note. Um, other people make these. I think ours are a little bit less expensive, but you can find them at the office supply store. The beautiful thing about plastic sticky notes is they don't bend over and get stuck, right? I mean, I'm sure they would eventually, or you could make them bend over and get stuck, but they don't usually. So this says Valentine's Day. This one is sports. So all I'm going to do with these stacks is once I get my paper vertically, I'm going to take this Valentine stack and I'm going to slide it right into the um, holiday and seasons, the calendar year section, as close to Valentine's Day as possible. And then when I'm working on a Valentine's project and I'm thumbing through my Valentine paper in my February month, I'm also going to see that I have this stack right there and it's going to be easy to pull out and easy to put back, right? So. Regardless of the size, you're going to do the same thing. Look at this little stack, a little six by six Halloween stack. This is just going to go in the fall section or Halloween section, depending on how you have your paper organized. Again, I just put a little sticky note on it. Can you zoom in on that, Sue? Can you see that? Look what I did. I used washi tape to label that. So I just want to um, use this as a little encouraging moment. Uh, when your stuff is organized and you can get to things quickly and easily, 
using your supplies, like I did right here, I just cut this little piece off Halloween washi tape off and stuck it on the tab. It's still one of our little, look, just one of our little sticky tabs. Um, but you're able to use your stuff more often in easier, in other ways because it's easy to find it, right? So if you can easily get to your Valentine's Day washi tape, right, then you can take your roll of washi tape and you can tape a placemat right on the breakfast table for your kids' breakfast, put their cereal bowl down or your husband's coffee and his toast, whatever it is, right? You can do like cool, fast things because you can find your stuff quickly and easily. Um, things that you can't do if you have to really like, oh my gosh, I know I have Valentine's washi tape. Where is it? I'll never find it in time, right? Makes it super easy. So I'm encouraging you. When you stack your paper up, right, it doesn't matter that it's two different sizes. Now, or three different sizes or four different sizes because the tabs are going to stick out the end and you're going to be able to see everything and use it. So don't be afraid to mix your paper sizes together. Now, I know that freaks some of you out, right? Um, we, I'm going to talk about paper storage boxes and different ways to store your paper after uh, class today. You can store all your 6x6 six six paper together and all your 8 by paper together, and all your 8 and a half by 11, and all your 12 by 12, and all your scraps. That's what you want to do. But remember that that also forces you to look in multiple places for that Halloween paper. Whereas if you have your eight, 6 by 6 Halloween paper, then 8 by 8, then 12 by 12, all vertically in your paper storage box, you're going to see what all your choices are, one-stop shopping. And that is what our goal is. All right. <sighs> Kitchen Stacks lecture. Done. Let me move my props out of the way here. I have to catch up on my PowerPoint. Okay, let's talk about the physical process of sorting paper. Oh, um, there's two ways to do it, or two ways that I would recommend doing it. The first way is to take the themes and sentiments list that you created uh, last week and um, create some sorting templates for yourself, right? So I used 12 by 18 paper. This is from the dollar store. Um, I just drew a line at the six inch mark and then I wrote on this side whatever it was. So if you had themes S and you had sports and maybe you had, what else starts with S? I don't know. We'll just call it sports. Here's a good one. Fall, right? Fall. These are all the things that happen in fall. So you can list the main category and then the subcategories there, right? Okay. You're just going to go through your themes and sentiments list. So you're going to do themes and sentiments, then you're going to do calendar year, and then you're going to do the rainbow. Now, when I first did this, I didn't write my themes and sentiments list first. So if you neglected your themes and sentiments list and you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to make my things and just call it, you know, S, T, A, whatever, and then I'll just go from there. This is what happened to me. That's what I did. And um, I made my sorting templates for all the letters of the alphabet. I was smart enough to put like W, X, Y, Z all into one, right? What's in there? Zoo. Um, I think that's it. Xylophone, yaks, things I don't have any supplies for, but I did have some zoo things. So I had all these sorting templates and I used the floor of my house to sort these things out. Well, there were things that I didn't have anything for. You know, I think I didn't have anything for O, I didn't, don't think I had anything for L, maybe M, whatever it was. So I had all these extra sorting templates that I didn't actually need because I didn't think about making my themes and sentiments list first. So. If you skip that step, you need to go back and do it. If you're going to sort, well, you, you're going to need these regardless. Whether or not you use them for paper is, is going to be up to you. I'm going to show you another way to sort paper. But the idea behind the sorting templates is that you can then spread them out. And so, like I said, when I did this the first time, my living room and dining room were like all ran together. I pushed all my furniture back against the wall and I just made a trail of sorting templates and then I could walk along and sort pile by pile onto those templates, right? So that worked, it worked, I did it, um, it worked fine. I didn't know any different, but there's a better, better way when we talk about paper. And as far as paper goes, the better way is to sort vertically as well, right? So this is just one of our paper storage boxes. Um, 
I'll talk more about them at the end after class, but you get five of these in a set, and that'll hold about 2,500 sheets of paper. But when, you, when you're first sorting, you don't want to use all five of them. You can set all five of them up, but you can see I took our paper storage box dividers, right? And I created, I, I labeled them, so A, B, C, F, S. So these would be things, there's probably a T in there too, yeah, travel. These would be themes that I scrap about, right? So I'm going to be able to sort behind those. Um, you can go ahead and label them with Beach Baby Birthday uh, when you, before you start. I would discourage that initially because you never really know how much stuff you have for that particular theme. Like I thought I had a ton of stuff for beach, and, but I really didn't. And um, I ended up having a lot of stuff for birthday and I didn't think that I did. So if you just go with your major categories and then as you're sorting paper, then you're going to add sticky notes to subdivide them within that category. But you want to start with just one box and then I'm going to turn this kind of this way so I can see what I'm doing. And I have kind of a cheater pile here, right, because I just took this out of my paper storage, but it'll give you the idea. You're going to just start with one box and you're going to go through your paper pile and just sort. Okay, this is all ancestry, so you're going to drop that all into A. And the reason you're only starting with one box is because if you took these dividers and divided them out over five boxes, which again, I have done. What happens is you only have one or two sheets of paper, three or four dividers in a box, and the paper slumps down. Let me show you. So when you just have one or two sheets of paper in the box, the paper slumps down and the dividers slump down, and you're constantly pulling them up to, to, to dig through them and add something in the middle, right? Because there's not enough support between them. So put that back in on the mall. So if you start with just one box and then when that box gets a little bit tight then split it in half and then work with two boxes and then split it in thirds, fourths, whatever so that the papers and the dividers hold each other up so that you're not constantly like digging down and straightening things up. But it's really simple the process of then just going okay this is beach so that's going to go in B my little dividers in here. I need to leave them or I'll make a mess. So specialty papers, as you come across specialty papers, this paper is die cut across the top, right? And um, there's actually two. There's a, one like a wave and then the sandcastle. Well, you want to protect those papers as you're storing them. So you can use any number of things. This is called a paper pocket. We also make something called a side loader single um, and a super size single. But things like this, you want, do want to add some kind of protection, but it's still just going to go right in beach with all the rest of your beach things, right? So this one, I also, you guys are gonna get sick of these by the end of the challenge. Um, I just used our little shut your flap tabs again to label these. So the nice thing about using sticky notes to label things is that once you use that beach paper, you can just pull the sticky note off and replace it with something else, right? So you can write on it with a Sharpie and then erase it with you know, like a dry erase marker fluid or whatever if you want to do that. But the sticky notes are colorful and they're easy to replace, whatever. So things that are special, you want to protect those as you go through. So here we go. I'm going to beach. So, sorry, I put that right in front of the camera. All I'm going to do is go through, work through my pile and I'm just going to go through a small pile at a time, right? I'm not going to try and do a huge stack of paper at one time. Why? Because if you start with a small pile, I'm going to say three or four inches max, and sort it, your brain lights up. It's like, wow, look at me. I did it. I'm organized. I'm on track. It's working. Right? You get all this reinforcement, this internal reinforcement from your brain that's on fire because things are actually working. We've all taken on some kind of project that didn't work out and your brain just shuts down, right? So this is a way to work through a thing from start to finish, a pile from start to finish in a short amount of time. The other beautiful thing about organizing things um, vertically in your paper storage boxes is that it doesn't take up a lot of space. So if you have to walk away from that project to go do something else, it's easy to leave it out. Or if you have to tuck it away somewhere and then bring it back out, it's easy because everything is in boxes or just that one pile. So 
there's a bunch of different reasons to do it vertically. If you're sorting your paper, spreading it out using the sorting templates, it's going to take up a lot more space. And if you have to pick everything up and set it aside, it's a lot more difficult. And then again, it's more difficult to spread it back out again. And what did I say 10 minutes ago? If it's easy, you'll do it. And if it's difficult, you won't. So keep, make it easy on yourself, right? Work through your pile. Here I am, all my camping. No, this is, look at this. Look what I found. I found that my animal paper is mixed in with my um, beach paper somehow. It wouldn't be because I'm constantly rearranging my paper, I don't think. so. But it's so easy. You can see I'm just going through section by section, pile by pile. If I and of course your paper's not going to be in order like mine, but you're just able to pick this up and go, okay, what is that? This is um, natural, uh, National Parks paper, right? So it belongs in camping, but I wanted to keep it separate and label it easily. So again, I just put it in a supersized single pocket and put that sticky um, note on it that says National Parks. You don't actually, this is just regular paper. I don't have to protect it from anything. You don't even have to put it in a pocket to, if you don't need to protect it. You could just take that sticky note, National Parks, stick it on there, go to your camping section, put it into the camping section with that National Parks tab sticking out the side, and then you're going to be able to find it when you're ready to use it, right? So super simple. I'm going to get all the way through here. To keep, this is all camping. Camping to celebrate, I guess. So that's what you're going to do as far as your physical sort is. You're going to take start with a pile, and you're just going to file it. The greatest thing about this process is that you can kind of binge watch your favorite Netflix. Speaking of that, I'm having some trouble finding a new thing to binge on. So if anybody has a good suggestion, throw it up on the screen. And then, um, yeah, my husband and I are looking for new, new things to binge about. OK, so. It's that simple. And you're just going to go through the rainbow, the calendar year, everything that's in your pile, sorting it vertically into your paper storage boxes, right? That is the physical process of sorting paper. You can do it two ways. You can use sorting templates um, if you don't have vertical storage, or you can use vertical storage if you've got it. I have to get caught up again. Oh, I think I'm going backwards. No wonder. Um, I used our paper storage boxes and our dividers. This is what happens when I don't look at my thing. This was the, these were the first ones that I made when I decided to go vertical um, with, with attempting to sort paper. And these I just this, these were sheets of chipboard from the back of um, packaging, right? I don't remember what came in, but probably some page kit or something. And I saved them, and I just put a tab on them. So if you want to create dividers out of something else, it's pretty simple to do. You could even do it out of old cardstock, not as sturdy as this. You could just use a sticky note again to label it instead of sticking on label tabs like I did. But there's a bunch of different ways to create those labels um, rather than using uh, dividers. Of course, if you have the dividers or you're using our paper storage boxes and dividers, that's what you should use. Okay. So what do you do with your scraps, right? <sighs> Again, this is going to be another like, oh. OK, here's what I used to say about scraps. I used to say about scraps, pick your minimum scrap size, the scrap size that you'll, m smallest size you'll most likely use. And that ranges tremendously based on the kind of crafting that you do. If you're a card maker, those card makers are going to keep tiny scraps. And, you know, some scrapbookers are, are not going to keep scraps at all, right? So there's this huge range in there. So I used to recommend to people, um, whatever your minimum scrap size is, that's the size you're going to keep. And anything that doesn't meet that criteria when you finish a project is going to go into your purge box or into the garbage or where, recycle or wherever it belongs. Well, <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. But I found out that there are people with whole filing cabinets full of scraps. And that is not a good idea, right? When you look at the amount of paper that you have, I'm going to ask you again, are you ever going to run out? So you want to use your paper. You want to move through it. You want to stay current with the look and style and design. You want to use the things that you've got because the more you use, the more you get to buy new stuff, right, without guilt because you're actually producing things. So. 
before you decide about keeping scraps, I'm going to ask that you go big with your scraps, even if you are a card maker, right? Card makers might go a little smaller big, but I would recommend that you don't keep anything unless it's a half a sheet of paper, six by 12. Oh, right? Stomach ache. Unless it's something fancy, right? This is bigger than six by 12, but this is a piece of cork paper that's um, self-adhesive on the back, right? It's unique. I will probably keep this right down to whatever tiny piece is left of it. Um, so but unless it's something unique, but you don't need to keep all your blue scraps in every size of blue because you have so much blue paper or all your Christmas scraps because the style again of Christmas is gonna change and the odds that that particular scrap are gonna match whatever you're doing, not good. Not to mention the fact that going back to, if you like to buy new things and, and stay sort of up with the fashion and style and colors um, that, are po that are popular, you need to be using, moving through your stuff. So if you can do it, if you can stomach it to go six by 12, that would be my recommendation. Six by six, still okay. Card makers, four by six. Try not to keep anything smaller than that unless it's something special. When you finish your project, move those scraps over so that you can, when you start your next project, you can start with a fresh look and a fresh style and use some of the other paper that you've got in your paper collection. There's my lecture. Now what do you do with the scraps that you're gonna keep? Well, you saw how I put my scraps right in the front of my red section, right? Where is that red section? And I've got the same sort of, um, I've got the same sort of thing where I just went, uh, well, it's small to largest, right? So I want to see um, a little bit of the color, right? So you can just stand that up in the front of your red section, right? Behind my solid red scraps, I've got my print and pattern red scraps. Right? Or if that bothers you ooh, to just stand them up like that, you can just take a file folder, put all your scraps in the file folder, stick a sticky note on the side that says red scraps or red printed scraps, and then let me put a sticky note just for effect. So if I put this on here, whoop. If you stick the right side down to the paper, it's better. Okay, so if I put that on there and label this little orange tab said, red scraps, I could pull out all my scraps. It doesn't matter that they're longer or taller than the file folder because they're all sitting in the file folder, so they're all going to pull out together. So you can put your scraps in a file folder and then pull them all out together to look at them, if that makes you happy. And, oh, look, one got in the front. Um, you can, if you're using a scrap rack, you can say, okay, my smallest size is going to be six by six. And that means your scrap pocket um, in the rainbow section or the Christmas section or the travel section that has all your scraps because you are going to keep your scraps sorted by theme, holiday, um, or color, just like everything else, right? You don't want to say, oh, I'm working on a travel page. I need to go over here to my scrap filing cabinet and look for travel scraps. You want your travel scraps to be right with the rest of your travel stuff. Um, you can pick your pocket size if you're using a scrap rack and say, okay, six by six is my smallest. So I'm gonna have a six by six scrap page and then I'm gonna have uh, maybe a super size single, like the big 12 by 12 um, page as well. So you have two scrap pages going where you can throw, put those right in that section. So <clears throat> as an example, travel again, I might have a uh, super size single and that's gonna be everything that's bigger than six by six and then I'm gonna have my six by six pocket page and so any scraps for those themes are gonna go right in there with the theme and then as I'm working on travel I can go back and look um, do I have scraps that'll work for this so you can incorporate them into your vertical paper storage or you can incorporate them into whatever other storage you're using you may not be using a scrap rack you may be putting all of your supplies in a paper bag, in a Ziploc bag, right? So you may have all your 12 by 12 paper in here and then all the scraps in the front of it as well. The key is keeping those things together so you don't have to look for red whatever in multiple places, right? Okay, so 
Now you know how to sort your paper. You know what to do with your scraps. How are you going to store your paper? Um, but obviously, vertically, because that's what I've been preaching all for the last 40 minutes, vertical paper. Um, you're going to put your paper into whatever storage system you're using, and you're going to be following those three sections. So it's going to go literally the, the same as the, the four-section system, drop alphanumeric. You're going to go uh, themes and sentiments A to Z, followed by calendar year, followed by the rainbow. Same as everything else. Now, you can do it in vertical paper storage, or you can do it in your scrap rack, or what's probably the best um, thing is a combination. So when you look at uh, my scrap rack, some sections have paper in them, right? So things like Tooth Fairy, Ballet, St. Patrick's Day, these are things that I don't have a lot of paper for. I'm gonna take the few sheets of paper that I have for those categories, and I'm gonna put them right in my scrap rack in that category. So when I'm working on something, Here's a barbecue, barbecue one. You probably can't see it very good. But when I'm, when I'm working on something that has just a few sheets of paper that fit that theme, they're right there. Now, you want to talk travel? That's my passion. Not only something that I love to do, but something that I love to buy paper about. So I have a big stack of travel paper. It's not going to fit in my scrap rack. That's one of the, sec that's one of the themes that's going to be down in themes and sentiments. So sports, travel, beach, those are camping. Those are right down here in my um, paper storage section, themes and sentiments, Christmas, Easter, I don't have that many sheets of paper. Mother's Day, I've got like two sheets of paper. Those are gonna be right in my scrap rack, right? So if you just have a few sheets of paper, throw them into, in with the rest of your supplies. If you have a lot of paper, then you're gonna put that in to your, to your vertical paper storage or your rack system if you're using racks. All right. Whew. Um, we're almost done, so if you have questions, this is my warning to Karen if she needs to bring questions upstairs. Um, I'm getting ready to wrap up, but before I do, I want to uh, share a suggestion with you from Diana Regal Dawson, who um, I don't think she's still on board doing the challenge, but she was one of the early um, challenge participants. And what she did after the, at the scrap challenge was, at the paper challenge, she took all of her scraps that were reasonable size and reasonable kinds of colors, um, neutrals mostly, and she set those all aside because um, when we do the punch and stamp challenge later, you could use those for punch and stamp challenge going through that process because it's paper that you're going to use paper that you don't really care about. So you can set your scraps aside at this point. Um, make a little pile of those or a little box of those, thinking these are not going to be scraps I'm going to use here, but scraps that once I do the stamp and punch challenge, anything that's left in that pile goes away, but um, you can use them for that challenge as well. So you might want to set those aside. Okay, we talked about how to sort your paper. We're ready to wrap it up, ladies. Are you ready? To, I cannot wait to see what you guys do this week. I am so blown away by how many great progress posts we had, how many people just checked things off their list. All right, so your challenge this week is to get that organized only space all ready to go. Choose a storage tool for your paper. You're going to go vertical. You're going to go racks. You're going to do Ziploc bags, whatever it is. Get that, get that together. Create templates for sorting. Your goal is to sort at least eight inches of paper this week. Oh, more if you can. Sort your scraps. Throw away anything that's not going to meet your minimum. Hopefully it's a large, well, I shouldn't say throw away. Make a pile of anything that might be big enough to use for this stamp and punch challenge. Um, and then get pull anything out of your organized only stuff that doesn't meet your minimum. Put your newly organized paper into your organized only space. <sighs> Post on the Facebook group. Oh, here comes Karen. It's oh my gosh. Double sided. Do you want to know why I love Karen? Because look, she gives me stuff big enough that I don't have to put my reading glasses on. Wanda says, can she at some point go over how to deal with stuff overload when we have health issues and can't be in our space for long periods of time? and it becomes the dumping ground. Oh, I can, actually. So 
you gathered, or our, our goal here, one of our goals is to gather everything together and put it somewhere so that you're working just on one little thing at a time. Especially if you have health issues, um, being able to control your environment and feel like you're productive is, not, is good not only for your mental health, but for your physical health when you see that you're moving forward with things. So the, really the important thing to do is that space of that stuff that you have gathered when you're working with some kind of challenge, be able to take something out of there and move it somewhere else and work through it. So paper is a good example. If you could take your paper organization system, your, your paper storage boxes, and your pile of paper, close the door on that messy, messy room that's overwhelming, take your paper somewhere else, work through that process and get it organized, <sighs> that's what you're gonna feel like. Wow, I got something done. The other thing is, and the reason we start with paper, is because once you've organized your paper, you can start taking advantage of being organized, right? You can be like, oh, I'm gonna make a card. Oh, I'm gonna make a Valentine's Day placemat. I couldn't do that last week because my paper was a mess, but right now I know where my Valentine's paper is. Grab it out, I've got my placemat. I'm gonna tape it down with Valentine's washi tape, whatever you've got, right? So, but when you are overwhelmed, the thing that you need to do is minimize your distraction, minimize, um, what is it called? I'm drawing a blank. When you can see a big mess, it overwhelms your brain and you shut down. So you need to take whatever you're working on somewhere that's neat and tidy already. So even if you just clean a little corner of your dining room, Right, set up that card table so that you're only looking at something that's neat and tidy. It's gonna go miles because you're gonna get something done, it's gonna be organized, and you're gonna feel that sense of relief. And once you see the benefit, you're gonna be able to keep moving forward. It's huge, it's all in your head, all of it. Debbie says, what are the pros and cons of sorting solid colored paper separate from prints? Brain is wanting to keep solids together in a rainbow order in boxes and prints separate, not behind the solids. Here's the biggest advantage. When you are trying to match a print and a solid, they're together. Oh, here's my red polka dots. I'm gonna mat that with red paper. Oh, here's the perfect red paper match. I have it all in one fell swoop. I don't have to go somewhere else and look through prints. And if I'm thinking red, and I think, oh, I'm gonna use red solid, but I have my prints right behind the red solid, then when I'm flipping through, I might go, oh, Boy, this would be perfect. I don't want to use a solid. I want to use this print. So whenever, and I'm going to talk about this repeatedly, whenever you go to look for a craft supply, um, if you see more options, not only, maybe you'll use two sheets of paper up, woo, right? Because you saw those prints with the pattern. But um, as we get into other stuff, maybe you thought you were looking for just a brad, but when you got to your red section of embellishments, you saw that you had flowers and buttons and brads and ribbon that all would match. So now all of a sudden you've taken sort of that single idea and turned it into some amazing work of art. And it's only because you saw that you had different things that would work. So my... Um, general rule of thumb is I want to see the most options in the least amount of space and as quickly as possible and that's why I put my prints behind my um, patterns. Another benefit when you're putting things away and you've been working with reds you can go right to just one area and put both your red prints and your red pattern pieces that you didn't use away. So it just kind of streamlines everything and you're looking in less places to see more stuff. Charlotte says, am I supposed to store paper in the rainbow section or instead in the vertical paper files? And I think I kind of answered that. Just depends on how much paper you have. If you don't have tons of rainbow paper, then put it right in the rainbow section, right? So if you, um, scrap rack pages, right? So if you're, I'm assuming that's what you're asking about in the rainbow of your scrap rack. I don't know how many pages right here, but I'm thinking it's around 40 pieces of paper that I have in this super size single pocket, right? So, do you want to put 40 in there? No, but you can, obviously. Look, there it is. Um, but if you do, if this is all the black and white paper that you had, you could put that in your black and white section um, of your rainbow, right? Um, I might split it up into two or three pockets, but if that's all I had, it would go right into my rainbow 
section. Again, kind of what I was talking about before um, with the Debbie's question, if I have this black and white in the black and white section and I also have my black and white embellishments and my black and white ribbon and all the other goodies in one place, I'm going to see what all my options are quickly and easily. Um, most people are too much of paper junkies to put all their paper in their scrap rack. Well, it just depends how big your scrap rack is, I guess, right? For those of you who are familiar with the scrap rack, you can expand that thing out as long as you have tabletop to put it on. So ideally, yeah, get it all in there. All right, um, but this brings up another good point. Um, it's important that your paper storage system um, follows that same pattern so that if you're looking in rainbow over here for embellishments, that your brain knows your rainbow paper is going to be themes and sentiments calendar year rainbow and where to find that. So again, you're going to two different places, but the patterning is the same so that your brain can just follow right along and get that um, paper and get that paper that you need. Bonnie says, my struggle. I have lots of four by five and six by five mat stacks. Want to keep them with my other paper, but they don't really fit in the space that I've made. Well, Bonbon, bon, have you considered stacking them up in, I don't know what kind of space you have, so I guess that kind of puts a hitch in my get along about answering the question specifically to you, but I would think that if you were using vertical paper storage, do I have a four by six stack here? I have some six by six stacks here. I would think that you could do this, right, and put it in your vertical paper. It's not going to be as convenient as um, having them all this out this way because then you can pull them out, right, straight away, boom, boom. But if you had to stack them up dimensionally, that would fit, and then they could go vertical. Um, I don't know what kind of what kind of um, how your paper is stored, so that might not be the right answer for you. If you have to keep your paper separate, what you want to do is remember that you've got it. So um, driving yourself back to those mat stacks when they're the right thing to use might be the same kind of uh, device we talked about, putting a sheet of paper um, from your kit in the right section. Maybe it's just a quick note in the front of your rainbow section. Hey, don't forget the mat stacks. This is where they are. Or if you have a particular mat stack that's Valentine's Day, to put a note in your February section that says Valentine's Day mat stack is and then where it is so that you remember that you have it and then you'll use it. And that's really the key. That's really what we're after. Remembering what we've got and then knowing where it is so we can go after it and find it. I'll tell you kind of a funny, cute, cute story. Um, I don't know if it's cute. I guess it's, <laughs> it's one of the hazards of living in my house is what it is. Uh, last night, I was sitting at our breakfast bar, and Park was putting dishes away. And um, not that Park isn't a very willing domestic helper, but I usually do all that myself, right? I, I just like my things where I And I cook, and he doesn't, so he doesn't. So he had the meat thermometer. And he was like, where does this go? And I'm like, third drawer over. He pulls up in the drawer, second section back on the left. We put it in the third section. And I go, no, in the second section. And he like rolls his eyes at me. And, I'm like, and then he took it out and he put it back, right? And in his mind, I'm obsessive about where that is. But I know where it is, so I always know where to look for it. It doesn't take me any extra time to find the meat thermometer, because it isn't just willy-nilly in a drawer full of thousands of spatulas or whatever that it might be in, right? So when you take that time to plan something out and to have a system about where it is, it's going to be so much easier to find and so much easier to use, and you'll use things so much more often when you have that mental, that mental path. So... Um, I hope that answers your question, Bonnie. And I'm happy if you want to post up a picture of like what your paper organization looks like or what the space is that you're working with, and maybe I could answer it more specifically to what you're doing. Cindy says, what about non-theme, non-rainbow, non-digital paper items like pattern, sketch layouts, technique instructions, examples, ideas, etc.? Should we create a theme for those? Um, that is a great question. So I think there's a couple of things going on here. Uh, 
first thing is um, if you're if it's just paper that we're talking about it's definitely going to fit into the rainbow even if it's just patterned paper um, I think this is a more uh, question is more about things like techniques and examples etc um, here's what I would recommend if you have let's say you're flipping through a magazine or a digital magazine and you see a great idea for a birthday layout right and you think oh, I want to use that for my daughter's birthday pictures print it and put it in your birthday section and then when you're working on birthday it's gonna pop up for you right let's say you just see this great layout and even though it's a birthday layout the birthday part isn't what's getting you excited about it it's the way things were layered and the technique that was used right print it out and go ahead and start a section that's called techniques and you can put it in that section so that you can flip through it and see it so you're going to create your own sort of idea book right there within your scrap rack or within your organization system so that you can look through that um, if you are uh, super techie you could use Evernote right to store all those ideas in your Evernote notebook or your OneNote notebook and then when you're looking for ideas for birthday um, birthday layouts or birthday cards you can have them all stored there same thing if you see an article about a specific technique you're going to have that techniques for walnut ink techniques for punches techniques for whatever it is so that can be a physical book a physical manifestation of those things that you've printed or cut out or however you've got them there aren't a lot of scrapbook magazines left for us to cut up um, or it can be a digital or online version of that as well so but I wouldn't put it right, the only things that I would put right into your four sections are things that are specific to that theme, right? So like I said, a birthday card or a birthday layout that you want to use for birthday should go in birthday. Otherwise, I would just create a notebook of ideas that you could um, add to and organize by ideas and then whatever the theme is and the technique is, etc. Leslie, if you have one category for sports, should you have subcategories? Yes, um, because if you have a category called sports, that probably means you have more than one sport. Otherwise, it would be under that category, right? So definitely subcategorize. And you, well, I shouldn't say definitely. It just depends how much stuff you have, right? So if you have kids that are into soccer and you have tons of soccer and tons of football and tons of baseball stuff, yeah, subcategorize those. So when you want just baseball, you can get there quick and easy. If you just have kids that kind of goof around with everything or your husband or there's no big fans for a particular sport then you could just group all that sports stuff together so I would say if it's gonna take if you're gonna fill more than three or four pages in your scrap rack with a particular sport then subdivide it and if you're on, if you're just gonna have one or two pages then I wouldn't worry about subdividing can't hurt though especially if you're just using sticky notes what the heck Julia says what about sorting collections from specific vendors a lot of this question comes up a lot it's generally in reference to if you're on a design team or you want to be on a design team or you submit your work and knowing that or you sell a particular product close to my heart or Stampin' Up, right? And you want to know what vendor those things came from. I would still try to keep those collections. So if you have the basic gray life of the party, which is a birthday collection, I would put all that together and still put it in birthday. But maybe you're putting it in a super size single pocket page and just labeling it, you know, basic gray life of the party and all the pieces are together um, so that you know who the vendor is. If you want to keep all of your basic gray stuff together, you just need to tie it back into your four section system. So if you have all your basic gray stuff together, I don't even know if basic gray is still in business um, anymore. Maybe I should change my example to close to my heart or somebody I know is still around. Um, if you have all your basic gray stuff together, and then you have all the life of the party in that basic gray stuff, I would take one sheet of life of the party and put it in my birthday section with a little note that says, you have this whole collection over in the basic gray box, right? So you're just tying those things back and forth, right? You might put a note in the, in the paper pocket with all your basic gray stuff that says, don't forget there's one sheet of this in the birthday section in case you get there first and then you're, you're missing one sheet of paper and that's where it would be. So just connect them back. If you're going to sort by vendor, make sure within your four section system, if you're looking for birthday or Valentine's Day and you have it, 
spread around by different vendors that you know where to go and look for it by that particular vendor. And that can be as simple as putting one sheet from the collection in the right holiday or theme. Um, <laughs> where did you get the National Parks paper is the question. And uh, where did I put that? I'll tell you what brand it is maybe. I think this is uh, National Park and it's Moonshine Designs, which I think they're probably not around anymore either. But um, you could search it. It's called National Park Labels. And it's by Moonshine Designs. So it is, oh, that's not the one. Is that the one? Yeah, it is. National Parks, all right. I don't have my glasses on, so I'm kind of winging it there. OK. Um, Cindy says, are we doing the ugly paper contest this time? I don't see why not. Let's do it. So uh, we did this for the first time in the last Get Organized Challenge. Uh, we will give a prize to the ugliest paper that you put in your purge box. So in order to enter the contest over the week, you have to take a picture of that ugly paper and you have to put it up on the ugly paper photo album that's attached to the Get Organized Challenge group. And Karen's pro down at her desk furiously writing as I'm making this up as we go along. So we'll put a photo album up called the Ugliest Paper um, and then we'll figure out, I don't remember how we did it last time, if, we, if everybody voted or if Karen just chose the ugliest paper, but somehow we'll choose a winner and give out a prize next week. Now, I, do, I have to say this because it happened last time. Everybody has a different opinion about what ugly paper is. So while well, there were some things that were unanimously ugly, I don't want your feelings to get hurt if um, you see somebody's ugly paper and you think, I love that paper, I don't think it's ugly, right? So this exercise is wholly subjective. And um, so put up the paper that you believe is ugliest, paper that might win you the contest. And um, hopefully nobody feels differently. But it was super fun last, last time. We saw a lot of ugly paper and we saw a lot of comments where people were like, I don't think that's ugly, I think it's great. So wholly subjective, right? What, what's the ugliest paper to you? But let's do it. Let's do it. Karen, get that down on your notes. All right, that's the end of the questions. Thanks for hanging with me today. I'm going to go through your challenge assignment one more time. Okay? Create your organized only space. <coughs> uh, choose a storage tool for your paper. Create your templates, your sorting templates, or dividers that you're going to use to sort. You're going to sort at least eight inches of paper this week. Sort your scraps. You can have a box set aside for scraps that you're going to use for a future challenge, knowing that anything in that box after the future challenge gets tossed away. Pick your minimum scrap size before you get started. Um, put your newly organized paper into your organized only space. Oh. Post up on the Facebook group and tell us how you're doing so you can enter to win a you can be entered to win a prize. And finally, really important enjoy your reward for challenge number two. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I look forward to talking with you again next Tuesday, three o'clock Pacific time. I need to sign off, right? Like same bat time, same bat channel. Those are the older crowd. They know what that means, right? All right, ladies, have a great week. Have a productive week and I'll talk to you next Tuesday. Oh, shoot. Yeah, so he's like, hey, aren't you supposed to talk about product? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am going to talk about products. So if you want to know about product, products that we make to organize paper, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Let me get my handy dandy cart over here and I'll start talking. So the first thing that we make, super basic paper storage boxes, and those are the ones that work with our paper storage box dividers. Paper storage box dividers actually work with any paper storage box that you might be using. But the paper storage box dividers are designed a little bit uniquely. I got kind of a mess here. So you get 10 paper storage box dividers in a set like this. So if you're putting your paper storage box on its side like this, 
you can put your 10 paper storage box dividers in this way and see 10 different tabs sticking out, right? If you're putting your paper storage boxes on their side like this, they need to be on a bookshelf or have or in a cube or have bookends, right? They're not designed to stand up this way. The engineering design on the bottom, the way the box folds together, is what's going to keep it upright when there's paper in it. So just keep that in mind. It is beneficial to tip it on its side because then you can just pull your paper in and out of it. So paper storage boxes come in packs of five. They come like this. They're going to arrive at your door flat like that. Uh, they carry these at Hobby Lobby and Joanne also. Um, they also have the dividers at both Hobby Lobby and Joanne. So if you're wanting to use that 40 off coupon on something other than a, a paper stack. Oh, I didn't tell you what I do with my 40 off coupon though, did I? You know what I do now? I buy peanut M&Ms <laughs> if I haven't found anything um, to use my 40 off on. I buy candy on my way out the door. All right, so paper storage boxes. Going to come in sets of five, right? They're going to hold uh, 2,500 sheets of paper, about 1,500 sheets of cardstock, right? It all depends on the thickness, but you can get a lot in one. So this is our most economical option um, for organizing your paper. The paper storage box dividers, when you get them, they're in the package like this with all the tabs on one side so it looks like you're only getting five. They're designed this way so that if you're using your paper storage boxes upright, the tabs are going to be over the top of the box, right? So you can, then you have your 10 tabs this way. So that's, they look a little funky when you get them, but that's why you can either use them this way or you can run them all in a line the other way. So uh, vertical paper storage option number one are paper junkie paper storage boxes and dividers. Um, Karen has gone through the website and all the things that we talk about during class. She has put up um, just a block on the shop page that has the picture of the Get Organized Challenge girls, little cartoon girls. And so anything that I'm talking about, you're going to be able to click on that icon and see all of those things in one place on the website. So um, strongly recommend the Shut Your Flap tabs. Um, super easy to use. Uh, inexpensive in the big picture and they stick on everything. I'm using them everywhere. I mean, you, you've seen them a lot of different places today, but I, they're little, literally everywhere. And you know what else I discovered today? Aren't you glad that you're along for this ride as I just ramble on? I am using them in my planner because the large ones have so much white space on them that I can stick them in my planner and when you put them on a piece of paper, let me show you, it's opaque. So if I write something on here, I can still see what's underneath. So I might have a doctor's appointment and I think, oh, I need to remember to take my medical records and I don't have enough space. So I can just write, take medical records, right, and just put it right over the top. Or you can layer it up and make things cute as well. Okay. All right. What else have we got? We have got what we call a paper handler. Okay. This is another 12 by 12 paper storage option. Both the paper handler and... The paper junkie paper storage boxes fit in the IKEA cube. So if you're using the IKEA Expedite or Expedite or however you say it, and the Calyx, both of them will fit in there. Um, the paper handler a little bit tighter squeeze, but it, it does fit. That's what I have in mind. Right, paper handler has these like weird little punch out uh, pieces when you put it together that are kind of like legs, and so that when you stand it on its back this way, it's a little bit more stable. One of the things about them being stable is making sure that you have a good, they come flat. Like this, right? So when you get them and you fold them together, if you don't, if you don't have the corners squared up, let's see if I can unscrew my corners, um, they'll tip over, right? So you wanna make sure that you square up your corners when you fold it together, and then they'll stand up better. So again, they work best on their backs when they're in a cube or bookended with something else. Um, so these are a little bit narrower. They won't hold quite as much paper. These do have the advantage of the pull-up handles though. So if you're somebody who, this product works really well if, you're, if you 
have all your stuff in a closet or a cupboard or across the room and you have to bring it to your workspace, you can, if, especially if you have it on its back, you can pull those handles, pull it right off the shelf, take it to your workspace, use it on your workspace like this. One of the great things about vertical paper storage is if you're working on Christmas and you have all your Christmas stuff in one paper storage box, you can go to your paper storage shelf, pull the Christmas box off, set it on your workspace, and you're only taking up two and a half inches by 12 inches, and you're able to thumb through the whole thing instead of taking a 12 by 12 stack of paper and filling up your 12 by 12 inches of space on your workspace with that stack of paper. So vertical paper storage, it's definitely, definitely the way to go. All right, so the paper handler comes all by itself. Um, they're, they are $8.99, I think. Um, they hold a little bit less, but they're a little bit uh, sturdier, and they have that handle option at the top. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of posts about the paper handler because we had it on sale last week. So there's a lot of comments and posts about that. Paper pockets are a way to, well, let me, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go down here to my last paper storage box here. This is the 12 by 12 fab file. It has a handle on the top. The 12 by 12 fab file includes dividers, five dividers inside. The dividers are also a pocket. So whether you're putting scraps in there by color or theme, or you're protecting glitter paper or some you know, piece of paper that has delicate edges, you can use the pocket divider for that as well as a divider. This product is a great product for somebody who um, has to keep everything sealed up. Maybe you live somewhere where it's dusty um, or you have some other concern. So this is the only product that we make that totally seals up. Um, the handle is, there's a handle on it here, so when you put it on the shelf, you can put it on the shelf and pull it off the shelf using the handle. Um, a little bit narrower, so won't hold quite as much. I know there was a post that went up, um, I think on Instagram, probably on Facebook too, that broke these down. I'm sorry, I should have written them down for you. Maybe Karen has that information she can uh, add on about how much will fit in each one. But the, um, the... Paper Junkie Paper Storage Box, about 500 sheets. I'm going to guess the paper handler, about 300 sheets of paper. And um, the fab file, the 12 by 12 fab file, which is the actually called the extra large fab file, I'm probably going to hold 150 to 200 sheets. But hopefully Karen can, can clarify that. Don't fall over my pile there. Okay, so those are our three options for 12 by 12 paper storage, vertical 12 by 12 paper storage. Now, as I mentioned earlier in class, we also make a six by six paper storage fab file, right? It also has the um, divider pocket, <coughs> divider pockets in it. You can buy extra divider pockets. So this is, this the fab file comes in eight and a half by 12 by 12. 8.5 by 11, 6 by 6, and 8 by 8 with the pockets, right? Then we have two other fab file sizes, a 4 by 6 and a 5 by 7. Those were more designed around um, photos, so instead of having pocket dividers, they come with file folders. You can take the file folders out and absolutely use the 4 by 6 or the 5 by 7 box um, as a place to store those 4 by 6 or 5 by 7 mats. Um, you can use it for 4x6 or 5x7 greeting card blanks. I do that, but I leave the files in, I guess. The point I'm trying to make is the 6x6, the 8x8, the 8.5x11, and the 12x12 all come with five file divider, file pocket dividers inside them. You can also buy, the file pocket dividers are also sold separately. They come just in packs of five. So if you want more file pockets for your paper, they're available that way. This is how they come, the fab files. They all come flat and you just pop them together, okay? I'm surrounding myself here. Okay, so those are our basic options for paper storage. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Now, within those options, you may need some things to protect your paper or to keep collections of papers together.
So this is a super size single. It's that you saw this last week if you stayed for the product discussion. It's 12 and a half by 12 and a half. Like I said, I think there's 40 sheets of paper in here. So if I had a whole collection, all the basic gray, life of the party, I'd put that in there. All basic gray, sports guy, I'd put that in one pocket and label the side of the pocket, put that all in my basic gray box, right? That, that's a good way to separate those things and keep them segmented out. Um, this is the 12 by 12 pocket. So you can see I've got 12, a piece of 12 by 12 paper in here labeled at the top. So that's the one that comes in the fab 12 by 12 fab file. Again, <clears throat> again super size single, good place to store specialty papers, things that you're trying to protect, right? So this is a paper has crushed velvet on it. So I just want to, you know, protect those edges and corners. So I just popped it into a super size single. Now that super size single is going to go, even though it has the tab on the end, it is going to go in your paper storage box, right? The tab at the end might get a little bit bent up, but um, it's not going to matter. Put it in there. Uh, that's a 12 by 12 file pocket. Um, what else can you use to protect your paper? You can use the, okay, where is it? Over here, over here. You can use the paper pocket. So this has a little tab at the end. It's going to pop up over the edge of the paper storage box also, so you can see it that way. You can put it in this way if you're using your paper storage box this way. So the paper pockets are made of a little bit heavier fabric. They're more like our side loader single, so they're a little bit more thick and heavy. Um, so especially when you're talking about things that have like die cuts across the top or whatever, this is a good choice for that. And then the added benefit of being able to add that extra little label to the side of it is nice as well. Um, okay, what did I talk about? I talked about paper pockets. I talked about super size singles and paper storage boxes, paper handlers and fab files. What's on my little cart over here? These are just the packaging of those things. Okay, if you are going to Joann's or Hobby Lobby to purchase paper storage boxes, <clears throat> this is what you're looking for. This is what the dividers that look, look like also. So when you look at the packaging on the dividers, you'll know you have the right thing because it has a picture of the paper storage boxes on it. At Joann's, the paper storage boxes are kind of front and center, and the dividers are hanging on this little pegged out thing towards that goes kind of sideways. It has all the scrap rack pages on it as well. Um, at Hobby Lobby, when you look at the, it's on the, they're on the back wall of paper crafting, right? And um, the paper storage boxes, so there's shelving, and then there's pegboard. And the paper storage boxes are over here on the pegboard, and the, the dividers are four feet away, a level up in the opposite corner. So um, just keep your eyes open for, for what you're looking for if you're shopping at Hobby Lobby because they are kind of split apart. All right, I think that covers all of the paper storage options that we offer. Again, if you have questions about a particular product, you can call us. Our phone number is all over our website. You can email customer service at totally-tiffany.com. And the fastest response probably would be to post a question up on our Facebook Get Organized Challenge group. If you are not a member of the Get Organized Challenge group, I didn't talk about it, but I'm going to do it right now. If you're not a member of the Get Organized Challenge group, please join our group on Facebook because so much information gets shared there and there's tons of before and after pictures and there's somebody uh, alive, awake, alert, enthusiastic on that group 24 hours a day, seven days a week because there's people all over the world that have taken the Get Organized Challenge and might be able to answer your question or help you if you have something, um, to, so, so if you have some sort of question or concern. Um, the Get Organized Challenge group, you just have to search on Facebook, Get Organized Challenge. Um, all one word, and our group will pop up. All right. Thank you so much for sticking with me today to hear about our paper storage options. And thank you to Sue for reminding me that that's what I was supposed to be doing after the presentation today. I look forward to talking to all of you guys next week.